Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for our Incident Command System Tabletop Exercise. So just as a reminder um, for a little housekeeping, we are recording this webinar, so if it, for uh, any moment you drop off or you have any colleagues who weren't able to make it today, um, uh, we will be recording and sending out the recording and the slides uh, within a few days. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, be sure to go to the Q&A function on your GoToWebinar panel to submit uh, your questions uh, and make sure you select all panelists. If you're on Twitter, uh, feel free to tweet us at Everbridge um, using the hashtag, uh, hashtag Everbridge. So before we start uh, the general session uh, for the webinar today, uh, be sure to go to the handout section on the GoToWebinar panel and download the accompanying white paper, The 10-Step Model for Designing Tabletop Exercises. Um, it is, uh, is authored by our uh, speaker today, Steve uh, Kermando. So with that being said, let's jump into the agenda. Today we're going to be discussing um, designing a drill, uh, going through the 10-Step Model. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, pre-exercise planning. Um, actually running through an exercise, and then what to do for after-action reporting. That will be followed by um, a five to ten minute Q&A session. So at this point, uh, Steve, I'm going to hand it over to you. You may begin when you're ready. All right, Michael, thank you very much. Let me uh, just make a switch over here to my slides for a moment and start our show. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us today. Um, as Michael said, there is the, the companion white paper along with the program, and I will be making reference to that a few times throughout the, uh, throughout the program. Now, for many of you who have had any prior training in a command system, you'll recognize there's probably a one-day or a multi-day course that you've gone through. So we'll be using our time today to introduce, uh, reinforce some key concepts, talk about some novel approaches, and really stress the importance of applying the incident command system through your different sorts of exercises, including tabletops. Um, just as a quick introduction, if you have not uh, been on the webinar or a presentation with me before, um, just understand my background is as a behavioral scientist. This is my 28th year in emergency management, starting in 1989, and I really am focused on kind of the behavioral aspects of what people do and don't do and at different sorts of crisis situations. And you're going to see and hear a little bit more about that when we speak about our exercise scenario, uh, probably starting about midway through the program. Uh, but as, um, as a, a trainer and an instructor myself, I'm also someone who is certified and has been training uh, others in incident command system and NIMS and such uh, for the last decade or so. So we're going to take some of our lessons learned and try to apply them to how we conduct simple tabletop exercises. And what I mean by simple tabletop is, depending on your level of familiarity with, um, with exercising, you may be familiar with the acronym HSEEP, or H-S-E-E-P, Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program. When you're doing full-scale drills and exercises, perhaps even when you're doing different types of tabletops, there is a very, very good template um, and manual that, that's available from Homeland Security and FEMA that applies a specific formula, the HC sort of approach. Um, I'll tell you that it's rigorous, it's time consuming, it's an excellent model, but there's nothing simple about it. For our intents and purposes today, we're going to talk about simple exercise design, something you can put together pretty quickly, you can execute pretty quickly that still gives you a good bang for your buck in terms of exercising, but I would like you to learn more about exercising in general and about um, the incident command system specifically. If you or your teammates are not, uh, you feel not totally up to speed on incident command, You'll notice here there is a URL that will take you to FEMA's Emergency Management Institute, uh, their free online training academy where you could, and I would say you should, uh, take at a minimum the Incident Command System Level 100 course. That goes by course number IS100, uh, National Incident Management System um, number 700 course. That goes by course number IS700 just to become familiar with the concepts, the structures, and the language, because there is an awful lot in the language of the incident command system that is not intuitive. 
And if you're going to be bringing different partners around the table for an exercise, you know, understand that a lot of folks on our webinar today, uh, as I said, they come to us with varying levels of, this, of the experience and, um, and work in the field over their career. Uh, they may be very familiar with um, the language and the models of the instant command system, but that does not necessarily mean that all your teammates will. And to do the exercise well, any exercise, you really want everyone speaking the same language. So the instant command system concepts of you know, common terminology or a common operating picture uh, all go to one key concept of incident command, and that's known as interoperability. And believe it or not, given that we're talking about incident command and tabletop exercises today, that's probably going to be the first time and maybe the last time I mention that in a formal way. But the key concept of interoperability simply means, you know, how do our systems, our departments, our programs, how do they plug and play together well um, during a different crisis situation? And at the lowest level, something simple, you know, if my radio can't talk to your radio, we're in different frequencies, different technologies, obviously we're going to have a problem. Now, it's, it's interesting that when Michael and I started our discussion probably weeks or months ago about this webinar, you know, we talked about, well, how, how do we have a training or a webinar that's focused on having an incident command uh, system style um, exercise? And one of my comments is, well, you know, every exercise, uh, from my perspective, should be an incident command system exercise because we really want to encourage you to be learning but using the incident command structures in everything that you do. So I would discourage you from saying in some instances, well, we're going to have an exercise, but we're, you know, we're not going to use the incident command system. Um, what we know from a you know, behavioral science standpoint, and you'll get this very quickly, is that during a crisis situation, we don't rise to the occasion, we fall to our training. And you see in the, the little blue box towards the bottom, I use the expression often, uh, that it's not practice that makes perfect, it's perfect practice that makes perfect. So during every exercise you have, whether it's a tabletop or a functional drill or otherwise, we want you to be modeling what you actually will be doing in a real crisis response. Now, to that point, you'll notice that on the bottom of each of my slides, I've already inserted the, the footer that says this is an exercise. And so there are a number of things you'll see in the slides and in the layout that are actually intended to model for you um, some of the things that you would want to include in your exercise design as well. Uh, and, and obviously, for a number of good reasons, uh, that you just don't want to scare the heck out of someone during an exercise who walks in or gets their hands on these documents and says, well, what is this crisis that's going on or what did I miss here? So you do want to think about this idea of document security and exercise security and marking things up appropriately. But bottom line, really try to make every exercise you do an incident command exercise in some way. Now, that's not to say that your goal and your objective will be purely testing out, you know, your knowledge and your use of the incident command system. We'll talk about goals and objectives further in just a few moments. But in the background, your structure for the exercise should always be, you know, inclusive of the incident command system. Now, in our, in our webinar objectives, and this is, you know, going to be a different slide than our exercise objectives, because about halfway through the presentation, uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and take you through a hypothetical tabletop exercise. And, you know, we, we can't play together during the exercise so well. So I'm going to, you know, walk us through, talk us through, point out some key uh, areas for attention and maybe even some pitfalls and tabletop exercises. But our goals, or at least our objective for the webinar uh, today, is to talk about key concepts and tabletops. Uh, their design facilitation, their evaluation, um, to discuss how you integrate the incident command system, and I'll be using the acronym ICS very often for that, and then demonstrate that in the last part of the program in which we apply a, you know, the, the tabletop model of exercise using the incident command system structure to a novel threat scenario. So there's kind of, a, there's kind of three things being discussed and modeled throughout the program. And I hope that regardless of your level of knowledge and experience with tabletop exercises or with the incident command system or both, 
that there's still going to be some something you could take away from this. And if for nothing else, because of the novel threat scenario I'm going to introduce at the end of the program, and that, that should be something to think about. Now, as we think about this, there's a common um, error, the common kind of strategic error that I see often in the field working with clients of all types, right, public sector, private sector, and that is folks will say to me, Steve, we want to do a, you know, an active shooter exercise or we want to do a, uh, a bomb threat exercise. And we say, okay, that's great. I can understand the importance of doing that. Um, tell me about it. And they say, well, we've got this scenario and the guy's going to come in and he comes in through this door and there's shots fired and this is the way we respond. And my, my message to you is that's a purely you know, horse before or cart before the horse scenario. You do not build your exercise scenario until you've identified your exercise objectives. Now, you may have in mind that it's going to be important to test out something like active shooter. That's great. You could stick with that plan, but you want to make the details and the flow and the timeline of the exercise you want to make those aligned with your objectives. What are you testing? Now, at one level, you're always testing your plan. And for the, for the um, I guess, simplicity of our discussion today, I know that I'm looking right now at 344 of you on the call, and 344 of you each may call your emergency plans something different in your organization, in your facility. But I'm going to use this generic term today um, of emergency preparedness and response plan and the abbreviation of just EPR, all right? So I understand that those will be called different things in different locations, but we're all speaking roughly um, about the same sort of thing. So as we start to think about our objectives then, one of the first things to think about is, you know, how then, before I design a scenario, even though I may have a type of hazard in mind, before I really start to write the storyline, you know, what are my objectives? And one of the, the, the acronyms or one of the ideas that are often um, quoted in designing your objectives are to make them smart, simple, that they're transparent, that they're easily understandable, not just to your players, because your players may come from different departments and different disciplines. They may not be as familiar with you as uh, with the language or some technical aspects. So, so make your, your exercise language simple. Uh, when you create your objectives, make them measurable. You know, can we really see how well we did? Or just you have a, a general gut level feeling that, hey, that went pretty well. So the more measurable your objectives become, the more efficient and effective that they actually become in, in helping you make any necessary change. Make it achievable, which means don't set yourself up for failure by trying to overdo it. Make your exercises plausible, make them challenging, but make them achievable because nothing good comes out of setting yourself up for failure. Um, it reinforces the wrong messages. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of almost a flaw in exercising. So in, at least in table topping, we want to make sure that your goals and your objectives are things you could actually pull off given your resources, given your time frames, and so forth. So that ties into being realistic about what we're trying to do and making sure we're staying very focused. Now, we're going to talk about exercise roles in a few moments. You know, maybe that's the role of the facilitator or the moderator to make sure the participants are staying in their own lane. So we're staying focused. We're staying on task. We're watching our time um, because people certainly can go off on a tangent. Uh, we've seen in exercises people get really you know, passionate about the situation and, and go off on a tear about, you know what, we don't have a policy about this, and I've said so long we need a policy. During the exercise, not the time for that discussion. During the exercise, we meet the challenges. We're dealing with the different uh, injects and the different sorts of uh, obstacles that the scenario presents to us. And there's going to be, obviously, then a team of folks. There'll be the evaluator, the, the timekeeper, a scribe, people who you need to help facilitate the exercise. And, of course, those people, as, as you know, they won't be players. They will not be playing. So why test your plan? And remember here, if you just joined the call, I'm using this phrase EPR in the most generic way 
regardless of what you call it in your facility, you know, your emergency plans, uh, why do this? Well, the first is to go back to this concept, and, and this is a point you really want to drill into your participants, that the point of the exercise is to test the plan and not test people. It's not to see does, you know, Bob from IT, does he know what to do during this crisis? Does Mary from HR, does she know what to do during this crisis? That's not where we're going. It's to look at the plan, see if it holds water, and you want to identify gaps in your plan at this kind of level. Now, we're going to bring up another concept in just a few moments, which is thinking about doing your exercising incrementally. And that means starting at a lower level, uh, because if there are weaknesses in the plan, that's what this is intended to surface, and you want to correct those before you step up to something more sophisticated like, you know, a full functional drill um, for a whole bunch of reasons, you know, including cost and, and time, but also there's this other part about that, and that is there's a benefit to exercising, you know, especially something like a, a drill and exercise or a drill and a functional exercise in a transparent way so your workforce, so your employees get to see you do this as well. They know you're taking the matter seriously, you're practicing, you're rehearsing, but if, you see, if they see you fail, if they see that the plan is inadequate, it actually undermines confidence. And folks, I tell you from the behavioral science standpoint, you may be able to you know, recognize this easily, it's very hard to unscare people. And once they see us not do well in a, you know, a live drill or a functional exercise, it's really hard to take that back. So we want to see, if there's points of failure, we want to kind of see them in lower level exercises, things like tabletops. It's a chance to, to update our plan, to tighten it, um, to tighten relationships with both internal and external partners. If there's new people on your team, you've had some attrition, it's a good way to bring them up to speed. So honestly, it's like almost nothing but good comes out of something like a tabletop exercise. Remember, though, the tabletop exercises are one of several variants of exercises. And as I said, it does kind of serve you well to do this incrementally. And that lowest level of orientation is just, as it says, uh, familiarizing key people with elements of your plan and what people's roles and responsibilities are. It's teaching them about the plan. Because by the time you get to the tabletop exercise, you, that's not the time to teach someone about the plan. It's the time to test, can we execute the plan? So they have to go in with some knowledge. Now, that's actually another one of those cart before the horse situations. There, is, there are times when folks will tell me, oh, we're playing a tabletop. I say, well, show me your plan, or we're working on the plan. No, man, get the plan together first, because that's what you're going to be testing in your exercise. And of course, then brief people, train people on the plan before you move to tabletop exercises, and you want to go through those steps before you get to more complex and more expensive things like functional drills and full-scale drills where you're really bringing you know, all the cavalry out, you get everybody else in motion, um, and if there was a flaw in the plan, you know, you'll see it there as well. But if there's something that's fixable at a lower level during tabletops, yeah, you want to take care of it at that level. So the tabletop exercise is kind of a, it's kind of a guided discussion, right? It's supposed to be done in a low-stress environment. Um, it, it should be a plausible scenario that everyone can get around and say, yeah, that kind of thing, it, it could really happen here. Uh, but we, we're going to test that we actually believe that we have the ability to handle this scenario, whatever the exercise scenario is, and we're going to define, you know, three, maybe four um, objectives very specifically to see if we could do those and see how well we do or what needs correction and adjustment. So tabletops are just a really, really good way to do that. And I'm discussing today, as we mentioned, simple tabletop exercise design, and I'm going to be discussing an exercise that's about two hours long an hour for exercising, and an hour for your hot wash and your debriefing. And, and out of that later flows your after action report. Now, obviously, as I said, depending on your level of sophistication and your organizations, 
you may have some onus, you may have some requirement to be using the HC for Homeland Security um, Exercise and Evaluation Program model and templates and manuals and do all of that. And folks, that's fantastic, but you probably need a good month or more to plan for that and really make that happen. Um, and, and honestly, it's not unrealistic to see it take four and six months to plan something that sophisticated. But with a simple design, honestly, this is something you folks could put together and pull off in a few weeks, an hour of play, an hour of discussion after the fact. So one of the concepts in all exercising, but certainly in tabletops that comes to play then is this concept of compressing time. Um, so we, we can work through a scenario over the timeline. There's some real good advantages for tabletops. It's cost. It's effective. It's a good way just to get people familiar with, you know, the, the core aspects of planning and how to interoperate with each other. But the disadvantages is, you know, they're not quite as realistic. Um, it's, you know, it's, sometimes people talk about, you know, uh, emergency exercise theater. We're kind of walking through, talking through. So it's meant to be, by design, somewhat superficial. And you have to... Um, kind of accept or be, you know, kind of suspend disbelief a little bit to, to make it work. That doesn't mean your exercise shouldn't be plausible, but it means that you, you need to be reasonable about that as well. So our tabletop is a chance for brainstorming and solving problems. It's to kind of dissect them and, and take them apart one at a time because once you're in, in the full live drill exercise or full-scale, you know, sort of functional exercise, it is stressful, and people are moving, and you've got equipment moving, and it's going to be a lot more dramatic. So this is kind of a good middle level. And again, you see it here in the blue box. Make sure you're stressing this point with your players. Exercises are designed to test the plan and not test people. I uh, jumped ahead a slide there. My apology. So you start to think, well, like, um, you know, who, who initiates this? You need someone who's going to be maybe the – sponsor or the host or maybe maybe that's the facilitator as well but you will need a moderator you will need a facilitator if you've got someone who's experienced in that role that's fantastic if you don't you know I've listed out here some uh, basic tasks for the facilitator and some of those need to be done actually even before so exercises whether they're tabletops or, ex or otherwise they're kind of best built or developed as a team um, please don't dump this on, on one person and say, you know, hey, I got the task for you this quarter. You need to develop this tabletop exercise. Now, even if you get that dropped on your lap, um, you may be the driver or the owner of that, but it really suits you well to go find some people to, to form a group or a team uh, for a number of reasons, you know, different perspectives and, and sharing the load. Um, having other people be part of that as well. And some of this you need, you know, you need to coordinate well ahead of time. The date of, an, of a tabletop you can set, you know, you don't have to make the date of it necessarily a surprise. You can. But what you do want to keep as a surprise to some degree is the storyline, is the scenario. You know, you want to have people responding in real time as you throw out challenges, as you throw out the situation to them. So again, without kind of reading each of the bullets to you, understand that there's some very clear roles for a facilitator, uh, to have a few observers who are not players, to kind of be at the perimeter of the tabletop, looking at the interaction, the process, looking at the content, how well people have done, uh, someone who's watching the time for us and keeping us on task, and you certainly need one or two scribes who are kind of, you know, on the flip chart or in some other way capturing all the action uh, because you're not going to remember necessarily after the fact. You know, the fur is going to be flying and it's going to be hard to recreate it later in our, our hot wash or in an after action report. So when you think about who should play, well, obviously it depends on some degree to the nature of the exercise. You know, what is the threat? what is the scenario that, that we're using, um, and that will inform you a little bit about, you know, who should be around that table. I've given you here a list of some of the more common functions or job titles or departments that people often come from who would be participating in an emergency-related uh, tabletop exercise. 
Um, at this point, given our dependency on technology, you're going to need like your IT people uh, to be part of almost everything. But certainly emergency management folks, security, business continuity, facilities, communications, HR. You see the role down here of SMEs, of subject matter experts as well. And I'll, we'll show you and talk about this a little bit later when we get into our scenario, um, this kind of novel threat scenario I mentioned, because it's a place where you may bring in a, a subject matter expert just to kind of catch people up on the nature of the threat. But depending on the sophistication and your objectives, you may actually think about bringing some people in from the surrounding community, you know, a rep from the local first responder agencies or local police, um, a rep from, if it's a public health sort of emergency, someone from maybe public health. So you can broaden this, obviously, beyond the walls of your, of your facility and be thinking about, hey, in a real crisis of this type, who would we need to be talking to? Who would be, you know, we really need around the table? Um, there's some basic logistics, obviously, to set up, and we're not even into the kind of the incident command aspects of this yet. We're kind of still talking about table topping for a few more minutes, we're going to turn a corner, get into our incident command sort of concepts, and then we're going to roll into our, our actually exercise for the last portion of our program today. But you need to think about where you do this. It needs to be, you know, comfortable. It needs to be private. Folks, although it sounds like a, a slightly different topic, when you invite people to the exercise, you have to really stress for them that they have to stay for the whole exercise. If they can't commit to that couple of hours of being part of this, you know, try to look at people's calendars and make this work where everyone can stay. Because if you've got someone in a critical role and they, they say, well, I can only be there for a half hour or I'm going to have to pull up and leave if my, you know, my phone goes off, um, that's going to really undermine the flow and the outcome of your, uh, your exercise. So that ties in a little bit to your, your logistics. Um, think about what you need for AV, if you're using any kind of slides, if you're using audio or video sorts of uh, sets, they can be really you know, helpful in adding a degree of realism to the situation. Um, but remember, you're essentially around a table or tables uh, so you don't need, you know, you're not doing a functional drill where you're really on your feet and moving and grooving too much. So in the white paper, we've laid out what has been identified by a number of experts. This is not, you know, my model necessarily. These are kind of the accepted steps. Once in a while you see authors write about a nine-step process, but usually a ten-step process uh, that starts with knowing your plan. So make sure prior to participating in the plan, everyone who's likely to be a player spends a little time going through it, knows what the key aspects of it, has a chance to familiarize yourself because they should not be opening and learning about your plan during the exercise. That's going to put a real serious dent in your outcome if people are wasting time, your time, their time, in learning the plan during the exercise. Define a goal. And the goal may be, you know, to test essentially the plan in a novel threat scenario. The, the goals tend to be big umbrella sort of concepts because where we drill down is when you get to the objectives. That tends to be like, you know, the fine points. Think about the team. Remember the team, that's the facilitator, the timekeeper, the scribe, the observers. They are not players. Those are folks who are going to have different kind of roles in helping you manage and moderate the exercise. After you've defined your goals, you create, you know, bring a team together, then you start thinking about your objectives. What do we want to accomplish during the exercise? What in the plan are we maybe a little bit unsure about? We don't feel totally prepared. We want to really see how that flies. Keep your objectives modest. Myself, I work with, with our teams, with our clients, three, maybe four objectives. But in the simple exercise design that I'm describing with you today, you don't want to have too many, too many objectives because you're not going to get to them all. And it kind of it, it probably sets you up for failing with a few of these. And remember, you're not gonna you're not throwing a softball here. You don't want to make this easy for your your players, but you also don't want to set them up for failure. So keep your objectives kind of reasonable and keep the number of them. Then you write the scenario. So as I said, you may have had in mind, oh, we want to do active shooter, we want to do bomb threat, we want to do biohazard. 
all good, but then drill down. You start developing your scenario based on what objectives. Look at it. Excuse me, I went the wrong way. You then pick the players, give in. I'm going to flip back one slide, guys. Hang with me. Once you've developed a scenario, that will start to speak to you about, well, who would we need around the table for that kind of situation? That helps you pick the right players, and you pick your space. Your, your team starts to develop the challenges, which we're going to refer to as injects. Um, bring your, you know, the rest of your team together. And at the end of this, you want to conduct both a hot wash, and sometimes that's referred to as a debriefing, and an after-action report. But those are two separate things. You're not going to use your time immediately after the exercise to sit there and write the report. You want the dust to settle. You want to collect your thoughts. But you do want to do some debrief or hot wash immediately after the exercise when people are still in the moment, when you know, the lessons are fresh on their mind, and of course you want your scribe or your recorder to be capturing all of that as well, because that's going to help populate your after action report. Do not, I guess let me reframe this. If you say to someone, you're inviting to the exercise, hey, you need, you know, you need to be part of this. It's really important to have you there. It's two hours commitment. People need to stay both for the exercise play and for the hot wash or debrief. Or again, they may be walking out of the room with very critical observations and information that won't get pulled into your, your report. The hot wash actually becomes the backbone of the exercise. I mean, the exercise play is important, but the, the hot wash is the big question. Essentially, we're going to break it up a little you know, more finely. What did we learn? You know, what did we just see happen or not happen? What did we learn and how do we make changes where necessary? So you want to make sure that you dedicate time, and that time is immediately after. Yeah, I mean, you can give people a restroom break or go get a coffee or make a call, but bring them right back, I mean, after five or ten minutes while their head's still in the game and take them through that. So I'm going to give an example that we're going to use in my, um, my scenario in just a few moments. And what we're going to do is compress time in a simple design exercise. We're going to do three 20-minute segments. And the first 20 minutes, they're going to kind of simulate hour one the second 20 minutes, they're going to simulate day one. And in this scenario, the last 20 minutes of the hour, they're going to simulate day two. You don't have to do it that way. You can adjust those time frames, but you do want to see how the exercise, or at least the story, plays out over time and how your plan accommodates the timeline as well. Now, as I said in my opening statements, Folks, if you haven't taken ICS 100 or NIMS 700, it's going to be important for you to have a basic understanding, and we're not going to have time today you know, to, to drill in. Very, very quickly, the incident commander you know, may vary depending on the nature of the situation, or your organization may have someone who's a dedicated incident commander regardless of you know, what the situation is. Depending on the story, you may use some other model of that, like a joint command or, or uh, a unity of command model, uh, or excuse me, unified command model. Think about our public information officer. That may be someone from communications. Remember the safety officers looking out for the safety of the responders and not necessarily the public. That's what our first responders are doing. And our liaison officers interfacing with all the kind of responding and assisting organizations. Operations are doers. They're the people doing the different tasks during the, the, the event, planning, as I said, just like it sounds, is planning our initial action plan, working through it, gathering intelligence. Logistics is getting us the stuff we need to respond to the crisis. And finance is thinking about how do we pay for this, how are we tracking the costs, and all those different ways. So again, if you're not real familiar yet uh, with this most basic design of an instant command system, you're going to need to get that under your belt to do well in exercising. Um, you think about it again in functional groups depending on the situation. And here I'm introducing for the first time my exercise for today. It's called Dust Devil. Got to give it a cool name, guys. Give your exercise a cool name. In this situation, you'll see who I invited to the table. and You'll understand more about the storyline in just a few moments. So I've got emergency management, security. I've got comms and IT. I've got facilities. 
HR, but also we're going to need health and safety, medical, nursing, anybody like that, and you'll understand why in just a few moments. Tell your team about the guidelines. Give them ground rules before you launch. You know, reinforce that point about we're here to test the plan. Uh, tell people again that what we do here is not precedent setting. Um, we may learn and have to change something after the fact. We're just, you know, testing this out. And be clear in their roles. You really make sure people understand what their roles are and ask them, don't tell me what you would do. Do it. You know, tell me, you know, make that call. Delegate. Tell me who you're going to call through. So don't simply describe and say, you know what, in this situation, I think we would do X. No, say, I'm calling John in facilities. I need John to shut down the HVA system, uh, AC system, because there's an airborne threat. You know, delegate and direct and give those instructions. Now, every exercise, just by design, has a degree of artificialities and assumptions. Um, as I said, we try to make the exercise as plausible as possible, but as I said earlier, there's a degree of kind of, um, you know, of it being staged, of it, of it not being necessarily as realistic as a real emergency or real exercise. And we all kind of get that, and we're going to kind of work with that. Understand that there's no, no one's trying to trick anybody, there's no hidden agendas, and all the players will get information at the same time. So for my exercise, which I'm about to introduce, called Dust Devil, remember, first 20 minutes of play, hour one. Then we do day one, then we do day two. We may take a five, ten minute break, we come back, we do our hot wash. Tell people about any safety and security features that you have baked into the exercise. For example, if I'm the facilitator and I say, guys, code 99 or code 900, it means stop, the exercise is over, for some reason we have a real emergency to deal with. Uh, I've been doing exercises now myself for like about 22 years, and I've had to do that twice during exercises. So it doesn't happen real often, but you do need people to understand that. If you're going to be on the phones, if you're going to be on the radio communicating, you want to start and you want to end every transmission with the statement, this is an exercise. And as you see in my slides, you want to mark up any of your documents and your paperwork to reflect that as well. So our goal again, test out the plan. That's our general our goal here. In this instance, my exercise today, we're going to try four objectives. Alert and notify our workforce and our key responders of a threat. Um, how are we doing that internally with our workforce and key players? Well, how are we using our emergency notification systems? How are we using redundant means? How are we coordinating with external responders and stakeholders? And how well are we using the incident command structure uh, to you know, really handle the situation? That's what I've identified as our four objectives. I would stop. I would ask the participants if they have questions, comments, clarifications, and then we go. Our exercise is called Dust Devil, and this is the story. Hypothetical uh, company, today we're all working at International Widget. Um, International Widget is located in Waltham, Massachusetts. It's been there for, you know, since the 1930s. There's corporate offices, manufacturing, warehouses on this multi-acre uh, campus. About 600 people work here, three shifts a day, seven days a week, but note, International Widget is also a known defense contractor who supplies parts for long-range guided missile systems, so they can be like a little bit controversial. Well, at 2.45 this afternoon, guys, oh my gosh, look at the time, um, someone in the executive office opens the mail, out of this envelope falls some sort of suspicious white powder, and the employee freaks out. They've got it on their clothes, they've got it on their desk. This a woman employee runs down the hall and kind of locks herself in the restroom, crying, freaking out, trying to get this stuff off of her. Now we begin. Someone has, you know, called the executive office. Someone has called 911. Challenge one. To the team, to the whole group, how will all the key players, I'm not speaking about all the employees yet, how will all the key players for your crisis response team or whatever you call it, how will they be notified we have an incident? 
how will they be given instructions about where to go, where to assemble, and initiate a crisis response? And we go around the room, and we go through that incident command sort of structure and say, if you're in logistics, if you're in planning, if you're an incident commander, or you're that communications person, public information, what role will, do you have here? What should you be doing, or what would you be doing at this point? And then we move forward, as I say, asking people in their roles to define that. Second question, given that this may be an actual biohazard, where is the crisis response team going to convene? Because if they typically convene in, like, you know, a conference room or boardroom that's in the headquarters building, that building may go be going on lockdown. That building may be off limits. Is there a plan B? Do we need to think about that? Very quickly, we need to address, given the nature of this event, who's going to be our incident commander, who will play those basic roles. And in those roles, we start to develop, as a team, our immediate hour one priorities, right? Given the situation, what are our most important priorities? As the facilitator, as the exercise designer, you may have thought about some different injects, so you build the story out with some reality. Um, responding facilities personnel have put on some you know, PPE, you know, masks, gloves, maybe a, um, a Tyvek suit. We've got our first police responding to the lobby. They're, they're trying to interact with staff, find out what's going on. Supervisors told people who are in the mailroom and those in the office to stay put because, man, if they've got any of that stuff on them, we don't want them walking around the building, right? But you know what? Your employees, they're starting to talk already. They're starting to call and text, and the rumors are starting to fly around your facility. So you're, again, thinking about your communication priorities. And as I said, in this scenario, facilities may be shutting down the HVAC system so we stop spreading any kind of uh, hazard. And, and one of the things that hopefully your team's trained to do if you have a white powder event is put just a simple clear plastic sheet over that. It's something that law enforcement hazmat teams can look at it then uh, without having to handle it. And if it's something that's very fine particulate matter, it's not going to spread, uh, you know, in the air. So someone's contained this. We're getting some people out of the way. We're keeping some people where they are. Your team is identifying those priorities. Also in the initial challenges then, how we, will we begin to communicate with the workforce? And look at those three bullets. What groups do we communicate with? Because if you're in the warehouse, this didn't happen in the warehouse. Do we need to communicate with you right away? Is that important because you're going to see incoming, you know, first responder units? Is, you know, we don't want to freak you out. Uh, and then based on the different groups, where they are, who they are, what are the different messages, and how will those messages be delivered? So if you're using your emergency notification system, if you're using other means, know that you're probably going to have to fracture your message, you're going to have to segment your message, and you might have to get it out in different time frames and in different ways. And another likely challenge is who's going to be interfacing with the emergency, the incoming emergency responders. You've got police here already. You're probably going to have fire or EMS coming, and you're likely to have hazmat or other folks coming this as well. So who from your incident command system? Is it the liaison officer? Is it going to be some joint command with your incident commander and the, their incident commander? Um, how is that going to happen? You would give that 20 minutes to work through and then shift gears. Guys, stop. First, first phase is over. Let's start with day one. How do we now go back, shift from hour one priorities to day one priorities? And you see some of the questions I'm asking. As I said, I'm not going to go through each one of these points with you. But are we moving the crisis response team to a different emergency operations center based on the hazard? Uh, what are we doing with the employees who are in, the employees who may be evacuated? What are we doing now that the local television station has started to show up? And this is where I said you want to build some visuals in, whether they're videos or photography. Build some stuff into your slides that starts to show some re you know, reality. Because once you see a guy in a bi biohazard suit in your office, it changes the mood, man. It really does. So you want to build some of that reality in, what's going on inside the building, what's going on outside the building, and then identify your day one challenges, day one priorities. How did they shift from hour one priorities? 
who's going to be doing what. Think about it as per each incident command function. If you're the logistics person, what are your priorities? If you're the planning person, if you're the finance person, if you're the public safety, if you're the safety officer, what are your concerns at this point? And we move through, including your communications people and your public information officer. What are they going to be doing? You know, with both social media communications about this and traditional media who start to show up, uh, and someone's already started this. You know, started the discussion about is this terrorism? Now, this is a place where I just want to talk for a moment about subject matter uh, experts and injects. And you see the story here. We're building it out. Six employees have been de decontaminated. Twelve are holding in the building. But it may be important that your folks start to get some information about the hazard. So what you see here is it's been determined that this white powder possibly is ricin. And your team may be looking at each other like, that's cool. What's ricin? This is a place where either you would have wanted to have some fact sheets put together already um, to talk about ricin so people can brief themselves or have a subject matter expert from the health department come in. Honestly, three minutes, four or five minutes, do a very quick briefing about the hazard if it's something people are not familiar with so they have enough to play with. And then we think about are there any other additional day one charges, like what do we do with the rest of the employees? Do we let people go? Do we let them come? Are we changing this, this you know, schedule for the shifts overnight for tomorrow? Um, who should be delivering this message? Is it, you know, the chief executive? Is it, you know, is it a spokesperson? Who should be having this discussion? And then we roll through the last 20 minutes of the exercise, and we have an outcome. In this instance, the test pot was positive. This was ricin. You have three employees who are hospitalized for inhaling this stuff, and you need to then talk about that. How, you know, what are our challenges? How do we begin to resume operations? How do we deal with the stress this causes our personnel? Uh, and the best way to do this, as I said, is as per each of our different incident command roles. We stop play. 20 minutes each section. You can see how I'm going pretty quickly through this. You're going to want to have a very tight ship. You're going to want to have your facilitator and timekeepers keeping people on pace. You want to create some stress with your tempo, not freaking people out. Give them a five-minute break. Bring them back for the hot wash. There's five key hot wash, hot wash questions. And make sure you hear from everybody and make sure you capture these in writing. What were our top three strengths? What were our top, you know, top three weaknesses or areas for improvement? What other kind of planning needs to happen um, that we learn from this that we need to adjust before we, we were in a real situation? Did we identify any other partners that we should include in the future based on what we just saw? And is there any additional training that we need that we weren't really ready for this kind of hazard, never really anticipated a biohazard kind of coming to the mailroom? So we capture that, we discuss our lessons learned. From that, we will later generate an after-action report that is circulated, that is put away as a record of your um, exercise, and is used to kind of motivate people to go forward and make those changes. So remember you have access, folks, to the archives to go back to these slides. I know I'm kind of moving quickly through these last few, uh, last few slides about lessons learned. And your lessons learned, they're going to be unique to you, to your organization, to the nature of the threat. But the whole point was to come out of this with those lessons. So the bottom message in closing out, and we're going to have Mike talk to you for a few minutes and then answer a few questions. Um, is just how important it is to continue to exercise, you know, periodically and as you can do this. Uh, I, I very often uh, use this quote, we don't practice until we get it right, we practice until we can't get it wrong. Obviously, that requires repetition, it requires a commitment to doing this and then stepping up to larger full-scale exercises as you go. So that's a very quick review, folks. I know our time went really fast. It sure did for me. Remember that as kind of going forward, if you're not familiar, get to FEMA's online academy, get the Incident Command and National Incident Management Systems training. Um, start thinking about how you would use a tabletop 
to test your plans uh, and how you build your scenario around your objectives. Mike, that's where I'm going to leave it for now. I'll let you take control of this, and then we'll come back for some questions. Thank you, Steve. So we're going to shift over to the next part of our presentation. So, Steve, thank you again for your um, your great session. And just be one second, everyone. All right. So. For those of you not familiar with Everbridge, I just want to quickly give you guys a, a background on who we are and, and what we um, what we do. So we're uh, we're an enterprise software um, uh, company, and really, what our main mission is to keep people safe and businesses and organizations running. So. Um, Within the market, we we uh, we cross a lot of different industries and are a leader in many um, different spaces, uh, from state and local government to transportation to healthcare to uh, private corporations. And in the last uh, Magic uh, Gardner Magic Patron uh, for emergency notification systems, we were ranked as the leader, uh, and we're the only publicly traded company in this space. So. Uh, what do people actually use us for uh, is an important question to ask next, and really it's for a variety of events. Um, private organizations use us for issues such as uh, product recalls, whereas government agencies like many of you on today use us for active shooters, um, hazmat issues, what, what severe weather, um, se you know, gathering responders, delivering information to responders, and also uh, residents. So what Everbridge really is, is a critical event management solution. Uh, typically during an event, um, you have, th there's, there's a lot of noise um, from a lot of different uh, sources, a lot of different tools, um, and trying to siphon the right information from all those sources, all those silos, um, and, and get the, the right information to the right people can be very time consuming, and ultimately putting your organization, your residents, your responders at risk. So what Everbridge has developed um, in order to uh, remedy that issue is really we help you assess what the problem is, who's being effective, what needs to be done. Then we move on to uh, how do you locate these people, where are they, uh, what buildings are they in, uh, and we give you the ability to act, deliver those communications, set, send the right messages to the right people at the right time, uh, and then analyze the situation, go back, look at how how your teams performed, how the notifications performed, who responded, who didn't. Um, and ultimately, that helps you um, make your collaboration and communication more effective and efficient. So um, for the sake of time, I'm going to quickly go through the three, uh, the three parts where Everbridge really fits into a tabletop exercise, the first being the ability to develop custom message and incident templates to delivering communications via multimodal alerts, to creating these after-action reports for continuous improvements. So let's dive into the, the first one, the ability to develop custom message and incident templates. Really during uh, a tabletop exercise, you're going to have all the right people in the room, or you should anyway. This allows you to go through these incident templates um, and make sure that they're following the procedures of the organizations that are in the room, they, uh, they follow the right escalation policies. The messages are constructed following uh, key best practices, meaning um, there's no jargon. You're using universally used language across all the different organizations, agencies, um, and departments that are going to be in that room. And you're going to make sure that, um, that these incident templates and message templates are completely understood and um, work the way that you need them to work during a real life situation. Additionally, Everbridge helps you deliver uh, communications via multimodal alerts. While everyone's in the room at this point, and you can probably reach them during the tabletop exercise uh, via email to their laptop, in a real life scenario, um, that's not going to be the case. Most people will not be at a desk. You definitely all won't be together. Um, so. 
what this allows you to do is to test uh, to make sure everyone's contact paths are working um, during the tabletop. So in that real life scenario, people uh, will be able to get that email alert, or if they're at their desk, or if they're in the field, be able to get um, a mobile alert via SMS or um, a voice call. And then finally, as Steve mentioned, really what a tabletop drill is meant to do is to test, test, test your emergency response plans for these critical events. Um, and where Everbrick fits into the hot wash and the after action reports is we allow you to, um, to, 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 to extract that information of how your teams performed, uh, where there were some deficiency or gaps in communication um, or response. Uh, and it allows your team to, um, to improve in those areas. So when that real life scenario happens, your team is as effective and as efficient as possible uh, because you worked out those kinks. You figured out where, uh, those, where those gaps were and you were able to fill them. And finally, um, with Everbridge, um, you're guaranteed multiple layers of redundancy, whether it's with our multiple data centers, providers, uh, multiple uh, NOC centers, um, to our support teams and multiple access points. Um, and as you guys can see, I won't go through every single one, but we have proven security through various different agencies. Uh, we're regulatory compliant across uh, different um, industries. And let's go to our, our next slide. Um, and this is important to notice, Everbridge has its own university, so if you ever 24-7 need uh, to refresh yourself or your team needs to refresh themselves or you have someone new in your team, we do have 100% free online uh, training modules uh, that you can walk through. We have professional service teams that can help you set up your system and also um, come on site to help you uh, with these drills. Uh, we have 24-7 uh, customer support meaning when you reach out to us, you are going to get a live person. Um, and you have, each customer has their own dedicated account manager. So you have your own advocate within the organization who's there for you. So for the sake of time, I want to uh, jump into our Q&A. We have a couple questions that have come in. Uh, we'll probably go a couple minutes over. So if anyone has to jump off, I'm going to try and get through a couple questions um, now, but if you do have to jump off, remember the session is recorded, so if you want to review the Q&A after, by all means, uh, you will be getting that email and you can review the full session afterwards. So let's just jump into it. Um, Steve, the first question we have is, how often should you run a tabletop exercise? You know, um, you should be running exercises um, almost continually throughout the year, but they don't all have to be tabletop exercises. Remember that I mentioned this idea of sequentially stepping up from lower uh, level exercises like discussion-based exercises to tabletops to full functional drills and things of that nature. So while you should be exercising pretty often throughout the year, and what that might mean is you know once a quarter or a minimum of twice a year, um, they don't always have to be tabletops and they probably shouldn't be. So you should think about your exercises as escalating in their complexity, in the complexity and their nature. Discussion-based, tabletop, you know, functional drills, full-scale drills, things of that nature. So exercise should be continual, but they shouldn't continually be tabletops. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the next question is actually for me, uh, so I'll, I'll address it. It is: Does Everbridge have pre-made uh, incident templates. Uh, so uh, and that was from Jeff in the audience. So Jeff, yes, we do have pre-made incident templates that you can, you can actually, when you buy Everbridge, uh, we have packages that you can purchase at a small additional cost. Additionally, um, uh, through our professional services team, you can uh, work with them to uh, build uh, custom templates for your organization if that's something you guys need help with but don't have the internal resources to develop. Um, so the next question is, uh, Steve, what scenarios uh, should you use in a tabletop exercise? Well, you know, you have to look at kind of your organization's hazard vulnerability assessment. And I know not every organization has the bandwidth to have done that. If you do, um, if you do um, 
you know, if you do have a hazard probability assessment, you want to look at those events that are kind of the more probable or more disruptive. So you want to have things that really have a degree of, of plausibility but real value, the kind of things that are more likely to, to, to hit you. If your organization is a bit smaller and you don't have that, you know, having conducted a hazard vulnerability assessment, it might help you to go either to the municipal or your county Office of Emergency Management. I mean, go there even by making a phone call and say, hey, listen, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about this. And does the county or the town have a hazard vulnerability assessment about what, you know, some of our threats are essentially in our neighborhood? Now, I'll give you an example. Um, we had a scenario nearby where, where I live here in North Jersey several years ago. There was a, uh, um, a kind of a home heating oil company. They also did propane. And one Friday afternoon, no kidding, one of the drivers is offloading the propane truck and lights up the smoke and, you know, kaboom. And, you know, a lot of businesses in that area, because this place was tucked away, didn't even realize that hazard was in their neighborhood, smashed out their windows, disrupted business, and they wouldn't have otherwise known that. So either you may have a sense yourself about the probability or severity of different you know, scenarios specific to your organization or your, or your geographic location, or somebody else probably does. But try to think, think about things that are plausible and things that are probable. So I can't say, you know, do active shooter. Well, you should do that, yeah. But you know what? Even though we hear about those and they're terrible, they're still kind of statistically rare. Weather events are much, much more common. Um, some kind of flu outbreak or, you know, disease scenario. They're still rare, but can be real disruptive. So I hate to give you this, like, really wishy-washy answer, but it all depends. But think about those two dynamics, about, about how probable and how disruptive the events are, and think about either going to your internal or your local hazard vulnerability assessments for some guidance about what those, those items may be. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so we're, we're a little over time. Uh, I'm going to go through one last question. It's from Janet in the audience, and it's actually for me. Uh, so she, her camp, uh, her uh, department's going to be running a live uh, scenario with a couple different agencies and the local university on their campus. So she's asking me, uh, for everyone else in the audience, can Everbridge send messages uh, to employees in specific buildings who might be at harm, and can they segment that so they can send messages to people in other buildings, um, a different message? So the answer is yes. Uh, with Everbridge, uh, we can use. Um, we can track dynamic locations, meaning where someone badged in, or uh, their static location, what, where their classroom might be for that, or for employees, again, if they badge in a building or access a local um, uh, Wi-Fi point, um, we can see where their dynamic and static locations are and deliver alerts uh, to those locations. Um, additionally, for residents in a certain area, if you were going to send a message to them, you could um, use our mapping functionality and uh, draw a polygon or select a specific uh, zip code or neighborhood um, to deliver a specific message to that area and even um, then send a message to other surrounding areas that might be a little bit different. So area A, where it's being the affected area, you might say, hey, beware, there's an active shooter uh, with some instructions. And then uh, the other areas, you might tell them to um, that there is an issue in that area, avoid that area, and please um, be safe. So with that being said, I want to thank uh, Steve Cremando for another great presentation. Uh, for anyone who um, joined us late or dropped off, signed back on, uh, we will be sending the recording out with these slides in a couple days. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, and thank you again, Steve, and uh, all of our attendees. Have a great day. Bye.